Good morning, everyone. I warmly welcome you to Awaken Talks today. The purpose of these Awaken Talks is to plant seeds for a compassionate society. And while we are all on our inner and outer journeys, these calls help us hold space for our guests who come from diverse backgrounds and who inspire us to offer ourselves to service. Behind each such talk, there is a whole team of service-based volunteers whose invisible work allows for the space to manifest. Today, our guest speaker is Parvati Baul, currently based in the interiors of Bengal at Sanatan Siddhashram, which she's setting up as a tribute to her guru. Today's Awakened Talk will be moderated by Gayatri Ramchandran. Thank you all again for joining today's call. We would like to start the conversation with silence to anchor ourselves in the space of the present moment. I invite you all to join in for a minute of silence. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome again to our fortnightly Awakened Talks. Today, in conversation with Parvati Baud, with Gayatri Ramchandran as our moderator. In a few minutes, I'll be handing it over to Gayatri, who will introduce today's talk's theme, and will also introduce Parvati, and then dive into the interview, which is titled, To Be a Person of the Heart, Pranair Manush, as Tagore described the Bauds. By the top of the hour, Gayatri will also include audience questions and reflections. So anytime during this talk, you may wanna share your questions and reflections for Parvati by typing it in the chat window of our live stream page, or alternatively, you could also send us an email at ask at servicespace.org. I will repeat, ask, ask at servicespace.org. Just as a friendly reminder, we are operating in virtual space with usual constraints of technology, poor audio, video, or bandwidth, and so on. So please know that if there is a technological glitch or for any other issue due to which we may lose either Parvati or Gayatri momentarily, we will allow for some time while they join back. It's so just asking for your understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, I would quickly and briefly introduce Gayatri, who is the moderator for today's call. Gayatri Ramchandran spent the first three decades of her life being at the top of her class at every stage and a PhD in biology from NCBS TIFR, which is National Center for Biological Sciences, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. She has spent the last few years balancing her head with her heart and engaging with a self-designed alternative curriculum for life. This is included learning and sharing nonviolent communication, working on her organic garden with more than 100 species of native trees, shrubs, and herbs, designing methods to move her family household towards zero waste, meditating and volunteering, volunteering extensively with Service Case, a global organization that runs several projects based on gift ecology principles. So welcome Gayatri and thank you so much for uh, moderating this conversation with Parvati. Over to you, Gayatri. Thank you, Rahul. Uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, it's uh, a real privilege and a deep honor to be in conversation today with Parvati Baul, 
a sadhaka, a practitioner of the ancient Baal spiritual and musical tradition from the lands of undivided Bengal in the Indian subcontinent. Parvati is also an instrumentalist, an accomplished painter, a storyteller and a performer who has spent close to three decades now as a Baal sadhaka. Although she has performed in over 40 countries and in many acclaimed venues and music festivals, Parvati's life as a performer is unique because she does not perform for personal fame, prestige or money. She performs in service to a mission and a vision that she was given by one of her gurus, Sri Sanatan Das Baul, who asked her to go forth and spread the spirit and message of the Bauls around the world. The energies that have been challenged her way, whether money or other forms of capital, to these performances have been used to dream, birth, build and sustain an ashram for Baul minstrels, practitioners and seekers who come in search of, the taste, of a taste of the Baal truth, the Sanatan Siddh Ashram in rural West Bengal near Shanti Niketan. The ashram broke ground in 2017 and is slowly coming into being. Parvati sees the ashram as a space uh, to make an archive of the Baal musical tradition, also as a space to see and serve the land as sacred by the practice of organic farming and by stewarding a collection of local native Bengali medicinal plants and other food plants. We witnessed this commitment in action when a rare white cobra decided to grant Parvati and us darshan when we touched base with her on a call last week. And Parvati was truly overcome with joy at meeting this cobra. She described, uh, she described the snake as a great yogi being and an exemplar of great restraint. For my part, although I have really never met Parvati in person, probably like many of you, I have been fascinated and deeply inspired by her wisdom her radiance and vitality visible even through the medium of online conversations and performances, her impish sense of humor, and her carefree innocence and freedom that she embodies through her being and her songs. Welcome Parvati, Joy Guru, and would you please bless this space with a song that you feel is appropriate for this conversation and this particular moment. Joy Guru Gayatri, Joy Guru everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted with great delight I be with you this morning uh, remembering the truth beautiful inspiring lives of the masters and their teachings uh, and to start with I would like to offer a song that was composed by Radha Shyam Dash Baul who is a great master of Baul Parampara and it says Anitta Vashona Charona Charona so leave away all this uh, temporary desires uh, and sing the praise of Hari. Whatever is supposed to happen will happen. Why are you worried about it? Why are you thinking and wasting your time? The worship and ritual, everything is useless in the modern time. It is only the name, the chanting of the name that, it, that will stay. So make essence, make the name of Hari as essence and always chant, always sing the name. There is no way out except this name. You were in the mother's womb. You went through all the sufferings of the process of being born. Don't you remember it? Time is passing. What is there in front? We don't know. Why not? You serve yourself, surrender yourself to the true master. <laughs> Sri Sri Guru Paro Bharosha Matrosha Om Sri Sri Guru Paro Bharosha Matrosha Om Sri 
श्री गुरुपद भर शाम निताय प्रेम नंद गौर हरि हरि बलो अनित a 
Thank you, Parvati. Uh, maybe we could uh, ground the speaking portion of the conversation by having you uh, tell us a little about, I think, uh, the spiritual and musical traditions uh, and background of Baul. So I've heard you describe it in other interviews as, uh, you know, Nirvan Natak, Theatre of Freedom, as Nirgrantha, as something that stands beyond uh, the confines of Ved and Vidhi, as Sahaj or effortless. And I'm also aware that uh, Baul is in some ways unique among the Bhakti traditions, the devotional traditions of India, because it blends seamlessly so many influences, uh, uh, Fakiri Sufism, uh, Sufi mysticism, Vedanta, uh, Vaishnava, Bhakti Vaishnava traditions, and the Shakta traditions. Tantric Buddhism, so uh, but and it, and it still stands outside the confines of uh, in any of these containers in some sense. So uh, maybe you could just tell us a little about uh, there, there's so much, but I would offer that you tell us about whatever you are drawn to explain about Baul, maybe the yogic aspects and some of the uh, musical richness in your uh, traditional repertoire. Could you hear me, Parvati? Did, can you hear me, Parvati? Uh, I, I can't hear you very well. One second, oh, okay. I have to do something. can you speak now yes <laughs> so uh shall yeah, i repeat now i can hear you okay. yeah shall i uh, no i understood question? only the last sentence okay the last so, sentence if you so, can. yeah so i was just asking if you could maybe open the conversation by sharing uh some of some of the richness of the spiritual and musical traditions of baul because that might help everybody who, those who are very much connected to baul and those who are maybe uh, hearing about it more for the first time to come to the same page. They, they heard you perform, but maybe you could give us a little uh, a kind of uh, background to Baal music and the spiritual traditions. Uh, maybe focusing a little on the yoga sadhana and the, yeah. I leave you to choose how best to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's talking about Baal, it's almost like trying to explain what is the sky. You know, everybody see different color and different forms and it changes all the time. So uh, it's so vast, but the only thing I can start by saying that if we want to understand, you know, Bharatiya Parampara, which is from the essence of Indian traditions, there are they, everything that we look into is starting from Shiva because Shiva is the Adi Guru, or the Acharya. So um, all the streams started from Shiva and including Baul has started from Shiva. Uh, there are two streams that coming. One is a methodical way of practice that is with scriptures and uh, a lot of intellect, you know, Gyan Marga is used. Uh, it's like a vidya, a knowledge that one is uh, incorporating inside. First, getting the knowledge, absorbing it, 
and then coming into the realization or the upalabdhi. And there is another school which is mystical, which has, which is, there is no method for it. And you just have to learn, I cannot say really learning, but absorb it through transmission from the teacher. Every stream needs acharya, everybody needs a guru, whether it is with scriptures or without scriptures. But in this, one has to open up to this cosmic library, you know, and which is written without ink, without alphabet. One need to open up to that cosmic library and then it will flow through. And there is a process for that. So in the old time, the acharyas or the guru chose their student according to that. For example, Naropa, have you heard? Naropa. So Naropa was a great scholar and he studied so much. Even he was in Nalanda studying so much scripture. But later he found that he had to turn into mysticism. But whatever he learned, he got it. Then he closed himself in the cave and he let the wisdom flow through him. Mm. So see, it, there is also, is, when we say two streams, it is also not different. They are you know, combined with each other. And according to the vessel, vessel means your adhara or your nature, what is the most suitable for you? What, how best you can serve to the world? That's how you receive it. So Baul has taken both the way. I mean, when you learn songs, it means there is knowledge, there is vidya, because you have to memorize the poem and you have to understand the tatwa. Tatwa is the... Uh, you know, the element or the, the gyan or the wisdom that is in the song. So this tatwa, you must realize and have upalabdhi inside. So that means you have to really study about it. And uh, not only studying in the, I mean, it's not really scripture studying, but absorbing, listening from the guru, because this is an oral tradition. And then practicing it, because bowels are practitioners. So they are yogis and uh, they manifest it in their body. And there is also Vidya, you have to learn dancing. It has a clear way of dancing. It has a clear way of playing instrument. So all of that is necessary. But at the same time, you know, my Guruji used to say that learn everything and then unlearn it. You, when you go to to give what you have gathered for through the years, when you stand in front of the uh, devotees and offer them the prasad of your knowledge, you must be absolutely like a clean slate and let that, what I was talking about, that cosmic library flow through you. <laughs> so you are not predetermining what you're going to say. Then it becomes sahaj spontaneous, but it is already in you. You mm. have become the knowledge. You have become the book. You have become that wisdom. So it flows through you. So to come to that sahajta, that spontaneity is. So when we usually come to know the, their, their Baul is you know, talking about heart, talking about um, abundance, you know, it is, it sounds like very fantastic. It sounds like, oh, it is so effortless. Yes, it is effortless. When you arrive there, it becomes effortless. But to arrive there, you have to cross all the stones and thorns and rocks, and you have to climb very difficulty. With a lot of difficulty, you have to climb out there. So to come to this essence of one being, you know, it's like, in a way, you know, taking away the layers that we put on, on, on ourselves through our mind, our uh, ideas of the world and uh, our um, quite egoic nature of thinking that we know everything. So all of that we have to slowly let go and something when the, when the leg of the heart 
is completely silent, then only the flower will bloom. Then only the lotus will come up and bloom. So same way the wisdom comes only in a silent lake. It appears in that, uh, that motionlessness, in that calmness and peacefulness. So Ba will talk about that. And um, so we can always, um, always think about uh, other things like it has, Baul has been, you know, if we look really into the history, sometime as a practitioner, when you absorb the practice, it is not very essential to know all this historical story, but it is good to know from where you come, who is your father and mother, which house you belong, what is your color, what is your language, it is good to know. So the Baul came from Natha Siddha Yogis and slowly they mingled into different, you know, they moved into different streams of Tantra and Bodha Siddha Charyas, Fakirs and uh, finally the Bhakti Parampara. That is the contribution of uh, Sri Chaitanya's disciple Nityananda and his son Bhattra. So he integrated all these uh, yogis and gave them Harinam Mahamantra. So Baul is a unique practice of all yoga, actually. And I always feel that uh, Baul starts from the essence, from very inside, deep inside. With the, with the heart of all wisdom. I think, uh, I feel that way. And most of the practitioners from other parampara also will feel the same about their parampara. Uh, but I feel in this way. And, um, and the songs are the one which holds the knowledge or the transmission. The masters, they didn't write books or big scriptures or uh, anything like that, but they have given songs. The songs are written in very simple Bengali language. Sometimes they have metaphors of daily life activities, for example, husking paddy or boiling milk or uh, you know, uh, uh, using the hand loom. So they have all these images and connecting uh, connecting with the inner process, how it happens inside. So, uh, and this language is so simple, but if you look at the teaching and the wisdom, it is exactly the essence sometimes you can find in Upanishad, or you can find uh, even in the Jaina, Jaina scriptures or in Bhagavad Gita or, or in, the, in the poems of great uh, Sufi masters. It is talking about that essence. So yes, I, I can say this way. <laughs> Thank you. I think that was quite a beautiful arc you traced for us. Uh, you, know, you know, one of the things I'm a little curious about and maybe you could speak to is uh, how uh, I've heard you say often that Bau Sadhana is so rooted in the body. You, because there is nothing other than the body that is your portal to awakening that's your portal to enlightenment and uh, so I was just wondering if you could tell us something uh, about how the, one of the maybe the first times this truth came alive for you where you know your body is your is is your road is your map to awakening and to transcend in some sense this uh, mm. sense of being limited by it or being only it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, both are right. Being limited by it or be only it. So uh, body is a precious, precious uh, vessel given to us. When we are born, we are given this vessel. It's for a lifetime only. And it has a time uh, of how it will change, just like the season. And, but each season has its own quality. It has its own flowers to bloom. And we practitioners must observe that with a very quiet mind. And um, if we know ourselves very well, 
our body. When I say body, it has all the layers, the layers of food that is made of five elements, the layer of uh, uh, intellect, the layer of mind, layer of emotion, and then this cosmic consciousness or this um, place of bliss or place of joy that that connects us to our true nature, to the to somewhere we come from and we return without this body. That also exists in this body. So to to realize all these all these levels and become a master. It's like becoming master of your body. Yeah. We say prakrito deho. Prakrito deho means the material body, and oprakrito deho, the the light body. Yeah. Prakrito deho means which is just functioning with uh, its daily activities, eating and going to toilet and giving birth, all kinds of things. And the other one is transforming the element, using every cell of your body to connect to that Anandamaya Kosha, to that subtle body, to the subtle layer of joy, subtle layer of uh, that, that place where you realize that you are this universe, the universe is within you. So if we can orient ourselves, orient all this, uh, aspects in us towards that then uh, then the body's body transforms uh, when you see a very normal person who is the ordinary person i'm talking about uh, who is so so engrossed in the daily activities the presence of that person and if you see a person who has detached with the detached in the sense have uh, detached with the with his or her own desires and has found this lightness inside. The presence of that person is very different. So, because along with the mind, the body also has transformed. Either you can change your mind, transform, not change, transform your mind through your body or through your mind, you can transform your body. Both ways is possible. It goes both ways. So uh, this is so wonderful. It's a magic. The body is a magic. And uh, there is a beautiful bowel song. Should I sing that? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. I cannot stop singing when it comes to body. <laughs> this is the vessel given to us. We must love it and take care of it and nurture it and nourish it. Uh, more and more. No, it's, it's not about placing a fairness cream. That's not nurturing the body. <laughs> it's not about how beautiful you look with the doing makeups. That's not your body. Your body is a vessel that holds the truth. And when you nurture that, that essence in you, you become beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, it's not about color, not about looks, not about loving the body means loving the divine, divine inside you. Moner Manush, the man of the heart is within. Like the uh, Vasavana said, no, my body is a temple and my legs are the pillars which is holding the body. Mm -hmm. So here is a song from uh, Charyagiti, which is very old text written by the time of 8th to 13th century. And uh, it's written by uh, Dombipad, who, who was one of the 84 Siddhas. And you can still find this poem, very important text for a Buddhist people in Nepal and Tibet. And these songs are also considered as one of the oldest version of Baal songs. So, Ganga Jamuna Majhere Bahai Nai. I am rowing my boat. Boat means this body. Hmm? I am rowing my boat through the middle 
of Ganga and Jamuna. Mm -hmm. So then he said, how can you row boat between Ganga and Jamuna? You have to either row through the Ganga or through the Jamuna, but you are drawing in the middle. How is it possible? Here it means the Ida and Pingala. Mm -hmm. The Ida Nari has a function. The Pingala Nari has a function. And when it's neither this nor that, it flows to the middle, is the one which taking to that Ananda Maya Kosha. So that is where Dombi Path is rowing his boat. So the one who is rowing is the Jogi. Hmm. And his Matang, Matangi means he's completely intoxicated in love, intoxicated in yoga. He is Kappa, you know. <laughs> Kappa means a madman. He's mad in love of divine. So, Leela uh, Parvi, he, he goes effortlessly, effortlessly he rows his boat. Bahat Dombi, Bahal, Dombi, go on rowing your boat. Don't stop. Don't stop here. And we will get back to the Jinaura. Jinaura means where is the place of truth, the abode of beloved. So I, I row my boat to arrive to that place of joy. So Pancha Kedual Parante Mange. So there are five uh, you know, disturbing um, pirates who come and try to you know, loot Karkejana Hesko. Means they have to do, uh, you know, steal everything away from the boat. It's, it's all our senses and desires. And, you know, when you start doing your yoga, something will come or the other or the other. It keeps on coming. Even if you don't want, it will show up. You know, for example, you want to do your yoga in the morning. You wake up and then suddenly a telephone comes. And then you take the telephone. Why? Just stop it. Don't take the telephone. First, you finish your work and then you do. But... Even if we don't want, something else will come. That is the magic of the universe to elude us. Otherwise, what the Maya Devi will do? Maya, she has to do her work, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's continuous. She's very sincere at her work, but we should not let her work. So that's what he's talking about. Hmm. So uh, the sail of this boat is made of sun and moon and there is no darkness wherever this boat is going is carrying its own light there is no money needed to to go on this boat the boatman the yogi will take you here he means the guru he will take you without any any price Price means coin, but other price will be there <laughs> that I'm not talking about now. So <laughs> they have their own account, the gurus. But it is not that material money that you need. One who could go in that boat, they could really go to that place, that abode of the beloved. And one who was hesitant doubtful whether to go not to go they just spend all their life by the river and they kept on sitting in the same place <laughs> so that is the story of don't be part i'll sing this song to you Achha, i will change my instrument <laughs> Gangayamuna Machere 
है नाई गंगा यमुना मझर नाई बुड़ली मातंगी जोया Who 
Thank you so much. Uh, I have so many questions I'd love to ask you, but uh, because we've heard your, uh, we've heard you play with Ektara, and then uh, was, were both of them the Ektara? Uh, no, this is this is the the Ektara, Ektara which is yes. Baul Ektara. I mean, mm -hmm. it is from Bengal. Yes. And this is called Tambura. Tambura. And, uh, yes. Hmm. This yeah. is used in Abhang also mm. in Maharashtra mm. and also you have seen in the hands of Mirabai. Yeah. So in the western part of um, India. Mm. And there are also the this Jnana Padavali that is mm. sang through this mm. and Bhakti Padavali. Yeah. And I'm very fond of this. Uh, I mean, it is not part of ball instrument, but I have incorporated yeah. uh, because I love the sound of yes. Tambura. It's so yes. beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. So, you know, yeah. I, the question, one question I have for you is so connected to that because I think in one, in, in, in another conversation, I heard you say that, uh, talk about the animacy, like the aliveness of, you know, the Ektara. And you said, these are not simple things. They decide what comes next. And for me, that really feels very resonant because I remember how, again, for example, Prahlad Tipanya talks about how he heard the song of the Tanbura and it, you know, it, pulled him again into this whole uh, singing Kabir Bhajan circuit. And similarly for you, you were on a train ride to Shanti Niketan with your brother and that blind bowel stumming the Ektara. It was like a chord, right? I think you said like pulling you from your past almost towards what was to be your life's mission in this, in this current life. So I, I'm so struck by, you know, because we live in this kind of uh, predominantly this world where we think of uh, material objects as material as though they're not vibrating with energy and aliveness of their own and that's not true for bhakti singers uh, for whom it, there's a kind of very intimate relationship with the tambura and the ektara so i was wondering if you could tell us about uh, you know your ektara your dugi and uh, how you first uh, formed a relationship with uh, these instruments and how they came into your life in some sense so uh, the ektara that I have, this one, yes, it's been, uh, think, it's been already twenty three years. This is with me, and this is the only ektara I'm going to carry till the end of my life because it's not that you change your deity. She's mm. my deity, mm. and uh, she manifests all the time and so it is the yantra that that is your worship and you need to carry this all your life till the death and uh, and then you will pass it on to someone who is capable of keeping it so when i met my master he gave me this ektara is made by ravi gopalan nayar and uh, he's a great puppeteer and wood carver and so he he lovingly made me two hectares. I have two hectares which I carry always. Uh, and um, my master, Shonatan Baba, when he gave me first time the hectare, he said that now you are Binadas. Binadas means uh, the, the servant of the Veena, which is Ekatantra Veena. This is one string Veena. So you are a servant of that. So let let your master take you wherever <laughs> she takes you. And uh, this ektara symbolizes the human body. Uh, the ektara, it is the, the sun and, and the moon. It's the, the Ganga and Yamuna, what I was singing. And Majhe mm. is this Anhatnad, or the sound of Om. Mm. Om. 
so a yogi is always meditating through the middle this middle cord so that is this is the symbol mm. of this is you see the sun and the moon i have painted it in case if nobody understand so <laughs> and and this dugi is something uh, is made of clay and uh, it symbolizes the 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 prakrita sharir or the sthula sharir which is the material body because we come from the earth and we return to the earth and uh, so so this is this is held up because this is connecting you to the other and this is tied to your waist because this is the body which will fall away and um, so so this and also we wear nupur nupur mm -hmm. is something uh, the sound we have ashtasatik sound that is the eight unstruck sound and among that there is a sound which is the sound of bells mm -hmm. so for that the bowl have you know incorporated the sound of bell mm -hmm. so uh, so this is in brief of what it means mm -hmm. so when the bowl performer is standing with dugi uh, ektar and nupur it's a complete yantra mm -hmm. you know it's a complete it's it's finished that form that form is complete now, everything has a form for example uh, in a very very simple example when you think of sri krishna you think of the flute think of the blue body think of this peacock feather you think of a bowl will have a ektara and a dugi and this crazy dreadlock or no dreadlock and standing with the nupur and dancing so that's the that's the form of bowl yeah uh, you know something i else i want to ask you about is uh, and I feel like it runs like a thread through your life because as such a powerful thread through your life because a lot of the work you do is uh, trying to be what uh, one of our common friends Brinda describes as being a living bridge between what is uh, ancient way of life and in some ways anchor it in the modern world because uh, your mission from your guru is to build this Sanatan Siddhashram for bowel minstrels and uh, other ashramis and but the bowel way of life is that of a wandering mystic it is beyond dualities and you know it is uh, there they don't there's there's never really been a sense of having one kind of gathering place or ashram so i feel like one of there are many things that you do in your life that is holding what i think of as apparent comp paradoxes or holding complexities and you're one of the few uh, women bowl uh, prominent women bowl singers and bowl women have women have always been in the bowl ashrams as dashis as you say but they've not received prominence or they've not run ashrams. And uh, you, uh, so I'm just, uh, and, and, but this is a way of life that is without, and this is a tradition that is asks you to move beyond dualities and dissolve all these du dualities. So I wonder how you see this, you know, like why is it that there were not more uh, women running bowel ashrams? Uh, and, and how have you, uh, yeah, and you know, how have you experienced this? Uh, in some ways this paradox and why uh, how do you live with this that you know that though they might seem apparently different uh, you still are very comfortable doing this because you're called to do it is that yeah Gayatri I just want to tell you that it's not all black and white yes because mm -hmm. uh, you know mm -hmm. when we think about women in bowel tradition immediately think oh how tortured we are or mm -hmm. how <laughs> difficult the life is well, let mm -hmm. me talk to you with all perspective to it, mm -hmm. because we need to understand our tradition very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not all in one sided, we cannot put in boxes. Mm -hmm. So you see the women held ashram mm -hmm. 400 years back. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. From this ashram where I'm sitting is another 23 miles, you know, kilometers away, there is an ashram which was led by Khepima. Hmm. And uh, she, was a, she was one of the sadhikas who were chosen by Bhidavadra, who is the son of Nityananda. Hmm. And, and she was a Natha yogi, you know, she had red locks and all of that. And uh, she was given Harina Mahamantra. She is the, one of the first masters of Baul who were given. And she led the entire Baul community. Her ashram was, they used to say, this was the high court of the bowels 
in the old time, you know, the community, that if they are the true yogis, if they're doing their practice, if they have done something which is not in sync with their practice, Kepima would take away their, uh, you know, Vesh, I mean, the Gerua or, or, or their Kamandulu or whatever is the symbol of their practice, he would, she would take it away. So she was one of the master and she was uh, devoted to her guru. Mm. And uh, she made the whole ashram in memory of her guru. Mm. And there being uh, suddenly, you know, sometime great uh, female practitioners like that, if we look in the history, uh, there have been also the other stories is that uh, there have been also uh, women, if they want to learn the bowel path or they want to find their way to stand as that, they have to do an extraordinary effort, you know, because uh, it is difficult path for both for men and women, but women has to put extra effort because they also have a place in the society which is not sometimes very respectful. So that is also there. So we have both the side, you know, and uh, uh, so it is a process that one needs to go through. For example, for me, I, I know the love and the acceptance I got from my gurus. I never felt whether I was a woman or a man. I mean, they were like, okay, come here. And he was equally treated like a man or, you know, man student and me, there was no difference. But at the same time, when I was going to another place to sing or to have an exchange or satsang, the other main bowel thought that I was useless, you know. So this is also, you know, this is all this contrast. I think it is there in all levels of life, in all the communities, this is there. So this, this we have to know because the tradition, which is coming from the, when you hold to the truth of the tradition, the tradition do not say that women are inferior. Actually, women are said as a Siam Siddha, which mm -hmm. is, uh, means that they are, you know, Sahaja Siddha. They are born perfected because they have the capacity mm -hmm. to grow a life inside them. So their body is specially made. So it is like the whole creation is within them. So they are considered as the divine and placed on the Matristhan or Gurusthan. Mm. So, uh, but at the same time, you can see the opposite stories too. So it's, it's something that we need to work through differently according to our experience of life and, uh, and help others too, to give confidence. And because sometimes women, you know, what story they hear and what are put up, you know, put on them as that um, they're weak or they're, they cannot do this. They, they will not be able to, you know, something which is, uh, I don't understand very well. So uh, this, uh, but if they realize that they have that capacity and go through that internal process and arrive in that science in the space because they're born with it, they can definitely do, you know, magic in their life. They can do great things and uh, they can. Absolutely, women can wear gedua, can hold ashram, can be the acharya, can teach, and can do anything. So we have to process it and make awareness. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, the other question that comes up naturally is uh, how you have this uh, one other initiative that you're engaged in called Tanti Datri, which is uh, collective of women performers from all around the world and it like you've said it's a word from Pali that translates to women holding the thread and uh, so, so uh, I you know and I'm so struck by this this is such a uh, there's something also about the times we are living in I think that requires the kind of in some sense a divine feminine to surface and to like be visible and to hold space and always almost I think like it requires women to come together in sisterhood visibly and be uh, and uh, like you know share those those energies with the world. So I'm just curious if you can say a little about that initiative and uh, you know what wh what do you feel about this this need for the feminine to stand in solidarity and to to take a stand in the times we are living in. 
So Tantidhatri was something that was created um, um, after I visited one festival in Denmark, mm -hmm. uh, which is called Transit Festival, and it is directed by Julia Verle. She's a great actress and writer and director, theater director from, uh, she's basically from UK, but she lives in Denmark. And uh, uh, she is now currently co-director in the uh, Odin Theatre, which is a very well-known, I mean, many theater people will know that. And uh, so when I went there, I met these incredible women from all over the world. This was my first time I met so many women at, in a place. And everybody had a unique story to tell and they moved me deeply. And, you know, uh, even though I, I, I come from tradition, my practice is spirituality, but the rigor and, uh, and the con to, to make it, you know, continuous process, the kind of transformation that you have to bring within through the life happenings and through many other things that you have to, you know, continuously work with yourself. I have seen in those women, they were artists or writers or social thinkers or many other different, different aspects they came for, from. But they also went through the transformational process in them, in whatever they were doing. And I felt that was, you know, very inspiring for everyone, especially for Indian women. So I wanted to bring this to India. And uh, it took me five years to manifest this festival. And uh, first, we, it happened in Pondicherry. It was Auroville and uh, Pondicherry Ashram that supported me. And of course, Aurodhan. Aurodhan is an art gallery uh, based in, um, led by Lalit Varma and Sharnaz Varma in uh, Pondicherry. They helped, uh, they helped me to hold the whole thing. And I'm really grateful to Aurovillians as well. And uh, after, uh, it happened in Bangalore with, in the space of Ranga Shankara. And uh, then it happened, the third one happened in Kolkata and in Rubindo Tito. It's a performing space created by the West Bengal government. Uh, the fourth one is coming on the way. Once in three years, it happens. We have also a book published on this first festival where every woman who came to perform, they, uh, women masters, I call them, women masters who came to perform, they have written uh, beautiful um, reflections about their path, about their practice. So it's very enriching to be in that space, you know, to be uh, to be uh, inspired and to be. Uh, there is also this sweetness that everybody, everyone carries, and this feminine, you know, this feminine quality that that is there in them is almost like, uh, uh, you know, a group of Saraswatis sitting there and, <laughs> and uh, you, you receive so much just by interaction, just by talking to them, just by being with them, you receive, you keep on receiving. Uh, for me, it is a space that I like to keep and keep it growing and, uh, and also broaden its boundary to let many other aspects also to come in, including spirituality, spiritual practitioners. Basically, it is a transformation we are talking about, you know, inner transformation. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, something else that I'm uh, often struck by is uh, like how, it, again, it's got to do with uh, uh, when you perform on stage, what you're performing is actually an intimate meditative process. It's, uh, some, it's, it's your sadhana as opposed to maybe, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, some other play or a music uh, piece that is curated with the audience in mind. Here you would do the same, even if you were meditating by yourself in your ashram. So, and I, I'm just, I'm just wondering how, uh, how, how you, you know, in some ways managed to do that, because it would be so much easier to just meditate by yourself. But by doing this, you share the sweetness with us and the world benefits, but I, I don't think it's an easy path or a uh, kind of easy cost sometimes to you, for lack of a better word, to take something that's an intimate, meditative, personal uh, sadhana and to do it on stage repeatedly because you were given this mission to spread this. So 
and just reflections on that i would love to hear well uh you know it is it is really precious your intimate practice uh if you can really do it yourself and be completely in peace you know you can be in the cave and just enjoy it for yourself but there are so many so many need to be touched need to be you know uh, need to wake up because they have that essence in them and uh, as my own reflection i feel so grateful so grateful in me that my master chose me to do this if i'm of any service my body my voice to the world it's it's a, such a great blessing and i can serve uh i can't say anything more okay. it is a great blessing to be the vehicle to be the vessel to hold and to share even if you you know it, it doesn't matter it is body is here today and tomorrow it's not there but it, when i'm breathing if my breath is used for this i am so grateful We are also so grateful. I, I Isn't I it 11.8? You have to take questions. Yes, yeah. we have some audience questions coming in and I'll pass over to Rahul now uh, to carry on this portion of the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Parvati ji, for uh, you know for this beautiful offerings. Uh, whether it is your response to our questions by Gayatri or uh, your soulful numbers that uh, you offered to us, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, and a lot of questions that are coming our way, and I would like to ask uh, a few of these. Uh, one of the questions came from Brinda as she joined us. Uh, just before the call. And her question was with respect to uh, the ultimate question of death. What does death mean in the Baal tradition? And uh, she was asking in the immediate context of uh, one Mahendra Mehta, whom you might have met when you were in the US. He passed on, uh, he left his body, you know, he had cancer. And his caretaker, Kozo, uh, is also going through the last stages of cancer. And Brinda was moved to ask, uh, what is the significance of death and how do bowels look at death? Is it like a meeting, the ultimate meeting with the master, the end of duality? Or what is it that uh, comes to you when you think of death? It is a moment of pause. It is a moment of pause to pass on to another layer, another journey. So this is how Bawal see it. A deho matiro bhando, bhangile hoibe khondo khondo. This body is like a, you know, a pot, mud pot. And uh, if it drops, it will break in pieces. But what was holding inside that breath? You know, inside the vessel also there was air and the same air will become the air of the entire thing. It was different as long as it was inside the pot. But when the pot is broken, then it becomes part of the entire universe to be born again, to continue the journey, whether towards light or towards life again. That is according to their choice and karma, karmic consequences. But it is just a moment of pause. Wow. Thank you so much. There is another question which is coming from uh, uh, Rachel. And she's asking, how are emotions understood in the bowel practice? Do emotions affect our senses? Or are they something that transcend the body? Can emotions lead us to the unity with God or truth? So the emotions are 
are something that is triggered from our vasanas. Vasanas means that all the wishes that we have inside us, we want to see something, you know. For example, uh, a lot of anger comes from the when the expect expectations are not met. So the expectation is something that we built inside us. But what was exactly happening, we are so occupied with our expectation that we forgot to see what was happening naturally out there. And because everything has its own harmony and rhythm and we can sink in that and let it happen uh, and, and adjust ourselves towards that, but adjust not in here. It's a different adjustment. It is, it's along with your entire being. So the, the expectation will not arise at all. You will flow with what is going to happen. So then whatever you say, it happens. <laughs> So the thing is that the emotion, how do you work with emotions? The bhakti yogis, there is a lot of emotion in the bhakti, bhakti path. There's a complete sense of surrender, love towards the beloved and uh, continuously keeping alive the name, the, uh, you know, the presence of Krishna or guru, presence of the guru inside you uh, through chanting, through, through these beautiful words. So it invokes this emotion inside. But this emotion is not personal. This emotion is a mature emotion which flows only towards the divine. I was talking to you that when every cell of our body will start to meditate on, your, on the guru, the body will become to the body of lightness. So this cell of this emotion, you know, all these emotional koshas or the layers of emotion also meditate toward, towards only this surrender, this true surrender, then, uh, then it is no more personal. It is not from the likes or dislikes. It is not, not from the want or not wanting. It is, it is, a, it is an expression of joy, expression of, um, expression of your being, in the flow of living with the divine. Beautiful. And uh, Brinda has a follow on to that. She's asking, uh, while you spoke of death as being a pause, but when you witness someone in this phase, how do you ease the suffering of those loved ones who see death as an end rather than you know, a pause or rather than as a transformation? And she has a request if there is a bowel poem or song of life or death or transition onto death. We have many songs on death because we love death. <laughs> this is <laughs> it's uh, it's it is something that we need to grow inside us. If there is somebody in that family who is a, a practitioner and who knows this cycle of coming and going they may not take even their own son or daughter or wife or, or father, mother, anyone who is passing, they won't hold back with that emotion. They will, they will think that everyone has a transition and, and allow the transition to happen by not pulling the soul back with our emotions and expectations because uh, it, it happens, the person who is dying is actually loves us very much. That, that person doesn't want to see us, that, that we are crying or we want him to leave and all of that. So he will also try or she will also try to stay with us. It makes them to transit. And the sufferings, it's prolonged and prolonged for this person. But if we start praying, yes, we are so happy that you were with us, you have given us so much. And now it is time that you need to transit and we are very happy for you that you are transiting into something else. And we will be here always with your memory, fresh, waiting, maybe we'll meet again. Can we pray in that way? Can we let things go and, and let things happen? You know, it's always, it's, it's the waves of the sea. It comes and it goes. The sea never dries. There's a beautiful poem of Kanhopad, 
is it one of these 84 siddhas he says chia sahaja suna sampurna this chittam this whole consciousness the being the body is at the same it is complete at the same time it is shunya there is nothing kanda vyagama hohi visanna if even if one is beheaded today and die don't be sad uh like the the butter is hidden in the milk but we cannot see with our eyes the same way there is a world invisible beyond this visible world what we see what we hear what we touch what we uh, we, we can feel we are always always touched by it but why don't you see that other which existing beyond what we can feel or see or touch nobody comes nobody goes from this world just like the ocean that never dries the waves come and goes back to the ocean is always filled up to the brim that is the song of the death no one comes no one goes <laughs> that's beautiful that's beautiful uh, there is one more question maybe uh, more material question pertaining to your life uh, you've made very unconventional choices in your youth for example to dedicate your life to the bhav movement and the question is how did your parents respond to such uh, bold calls of their young daughter and uh, and looking at it from your perspective what was your inspiration to take up this path you know which per se had no security you had to just let go of yourself or your sense of security your own identity so two But questions I, there <laughs> uh the first thing is that my parents they were very uh, you know spiritual very spiritual in their nature and they were devotees of they were they were initiated by swami uh uh swami ji from ram ramakrishna mission and they they are devotees of sri ramakrishna so they're very used to all this kind of crazy things uh but they were worried for me because i'm their daughter and uh they thought that how you know she will she will have so much trouble and so much hardship and so much uh, uh, people will misunderstand her and what she will eat in case if she fails in a sadhana <laughs> so they were they had their concerns like they love me you know they are worried for me uh, i am their youngest daughter so it is from that concern that they were very much saying no 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 you should not should not go for that especially my father but my mother said to me i think you should go <laughs> oh. because she, yes and she said to me that uh, the true living is living with the divine and and to find uh, the the joy of living in experiencing divine in every moment and uh, otherwise this life is very short and whatever we think of security and uh, and success and uh, and whatever so called things is actually temporary and it doesn't make any sense so i'm very happy you go your path wow and she wow. she gave me a thousand rupees to go on my path <laughs> because yeah. you were like 16 right when you first heard this song and yeah wow. yeah something that's something uh, there is yet another question in fact a couple of questions around the same theme padmaja and misha both have asked padmaja is asking could i as someone who lives a life of a regular city dweller find a way to practice the bowl way of living uh, could i find the flow where i am wherever i am i think she means that and misha is asking didi how does one traverse this path while still residing in the material world so kind of closely connected questions there yeah well you know i will not give you false uh, hope uh, the thing is that uh, i will be truthful and tell you the truth 
if you really want to embrace spiritual life, you have to let go many things. You must. And this finding, you know, doing this and doing that and how and where and I said, nahi hota hai. There's nothing happened like that. We think it can happen. If you want to be a practitioner, you have to transform everything around your life towards that. You know, it's like when you make every cell of your body to flow towards that. So even how you conduct in your life, for example, in the morning, if you get up and do all this practice, and then you engage into the activity which distract you and, uh, you know, stresses you and kills you almost mentally. And then all that work that you have done with the meditation, it's gone. So basically what you're doing is a maintenance, maintenance of yourself that you cannot call exactly uh, this, you have taken a spiritual path. You can say that I have taken the help of spirituality to maintain my life so that I don't break down. That is a good thing. But even as a grihastha, which is the householder, uh, you know, sit, living in a city also, that you can incorporate the spiritual life inside you. If your orientation, the life orientation, it moves towards that. What the, even including the object that you keep in your house. I'm telling very simple things, you know. If you surround yourself with the, all kinds of other distracting things, your mind will naturally flow towards those things. But if you only organize yourself, even to keep things around you, which leads you to remember the spirituality within you or the, the truth within you, that's how you can orient. The company you choose is very, very important. Very, it is the fundamental of what kind of people you are with. It is the fundamental. You have to make, find, we call make friendship with the truth only <laughs> so find the company of devotees find the company of uh, people who are seekers be in that company it will enhance it will feed you then there is no no effort with your mind but you are constantly mingling with people who are constantly worried about things then it will disturb you too because you are receiving your vibration. So these are the small things that we can change. It is not about two hours meditation. It is about changing the whole life circumstances surrounding, even the, including the object that you keep inside your house. Thank you. That's beautiful. I think that's the effort you were referring to, to reach the effortless uh, earlier in the call to surround ourselves with objects which kind of aid our journey, right? And uh, there is another question, I believe from uh, one of our volunteers, Rohit, uh, and it is around the convergence of the bhakti movement with uh, the other two streams of jnana and karma. And how does service, you know, which is in a way karma yoga, uh, kindness to human beings, to all sentient beings, where does that find a place in uh, the central bhakti mark or even you know where does gyan find a way in the centrality of the bhakti mark which is uh, in a way so core to the baul tradition where do these converge mm -hmm. so the baul is the three main pillars for the baul path is gyan bhakti and vairagya so gyan is what you're talking about gyan yoga and bhakti so the bhakti, when it comes from awareness, the awareness comes from jnana, your clarity of your mind, clarity of thought, clarity of the being. And when then the bhakti, bhakti comes, bhakti comes after that. When you realize, then the bhakti comes. So, so you need jnana to enhance your bhakti. Bhakti without awareness is, is fanatic, fanaticism. It's, it's not going to lead anywhere. You must know. You must, you must know in the sense not know here. 
but you must know with your being what you're doing, you, every action of you. You're conscious. You, you, you take a conscious action, conscious, even action in the thought. One of the greatest examples of bhakta is Hanuman. Hanuman has all three, jnana, bhakti, and vairagya. And vairagya, how it comes? It comes through karma. When you continuously serving to the mankind selflessly, selflessly in the sense of uh, not for it is not for your benefit or your benefit means uh, you know personal desires and what you expect, but you you let all your actions which brings uh, harmony in surrounding in the surround you know around you and what wherever you go. All this work doing, you know, offering these services, it will slowly free you from your actions. Then the bairagya will come. And you will do all the service effortlessly with great joy. Hanuman, he had done so much for his beloved Ram. He, he has gone to the, uh, you know, Gandhomadan to get all the Vishalakarali. He made, he worked hard to cross the ocean and meet Sita and all of this. He's a great uh, karma yogi. So, uh, all these three elements, when it worked together, then one becomes Thira Cheta. Mm where it is, I was talking in the beginning of my talk, a lake that is silent and still. And that is the time the lotus of Baul will bloom. There is no separate thing. Our tradition never divided. This is karma yoga. This is bhakti yoga. This is jnana yoga. One cannot exist with the other without the other. One cannot exist without the other. You need everything. The sun ray that comes from the sun has seven colors. How can you separate them? Just because we don't see. Just because we, we don't see, we say there is one ray. <laughs> there are seven colors in it. Seven colors in it because we see seven colors. Maybe there are more colors. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so it's all about that. Everything is related to the other. You are not, you cannot do something specific in, in the sense of, especially in a, in a box, you know. You cannot make this is black, this is white, this is gray. They're all mingled, just like the ray of the sun. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. That reminds me of uh, Dalai Lama who described Shunyata as uh, perfect interdependence. Not really a zero-ness, but the fact that there yeah, is no yeah. one thing, but everything is kind of uh, a web dependent on each other. Yeah. So you are in it and you are free of it. Same time. Wow. A yogi, he sees that freedom. He sees that harmony, how it moves, and he moves along. So he's never stuck. He's never blocked. That's how he finds his freedom. That's beautiful. This can go on and on. And uh, yet, I think we would never be, uh, I would say, we would never be at the end of it. We would want more and more. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I want to kind of end with uh, uh, what you chose as your message for the world, which is a quote by your guru to you, uh, I think during his uh, final few months on this planet. And he said, make your life into a prayer. And you said, uh, you shared with us that this quote is like a precious diamond, which you keep going back to and keep polishing. 
And uh, that's a lovely message for all of us. And if you want to uh, close, uh, we will be a bit over time, but I'm sure no one minds that. If you want to close with something which comes to you, uh, a song offering or whatever comes to your heart, we would be blessed to receive it. I will sing a song of my master, Sri Shanatan Das Baul. And uh, he talks about the true master and the true chela. <laughs> <laughs> that was his favorite subject. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then he says, Chetan Guru. Uh, the guru who is completely away. Well, who is it, one who is a chela of such a guru? They only can cross the darkness, the darkness of the night to dawn into the newness. If they're given only the syrup with the fire of the devotion, they can make it into the solid gourd or the jaggery. And that gourd never gets tell, never get go bad, never rotten, ne never rot. So he talks about the process of making good, about <laughs> making the true shisha. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, and at the same time, he says, I, I, there is a I'll explanation I'm not giving. He says that, but to, to become the true bowel, one must die, die before death. His guru told him that die before death. So Shanatan appeals that let this stupid mind wake up and see the truth. Chetan Guru Chala Jara Tadri Rat Kate Chetan Guru Chala Jara Tadri Rat Kate Tara Roshe Bak Mere Gur Kur Te Pane I'm <laughs> 
ਕਾਲ ਗੁਰੂਰ ਚਲਾ ਜਾ ਰਾਤਾ ਤੇਰੀ ਅੱਤ ਕਟੇ ਅਮਰ ਗੋਸਾਈ ਸਦਾ ਨੰਦਰ ਵਚਨ ਅਰੇ ਖਾਪਰ ਹੋਲੋ ਜੰਤੇ ਮਰੂਨ ਗੋਸਾਈ ਸਦਾ wow we feel so privileged and blessed uh, to be receiving these offerings uh, it just seems that uh, the words guru and good are also kind of linked <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful thank you for this uh, these gifts uh, parvati ji and uh, uh, for us as a community awaken talks community the service phase community if there is anything that we could offer you as service please allow us that opportunity and that privilege i let you know <laughs> <laughs> don't expect pani puri for this time <laughs> maybe the audience doesn't know that but i was uh, i was listening to parvati ji at uh, somaya college in mumbai and at the end of uh, her offering her performance the one of the bowls there asked her what is it that we can offer to you and uh, and she said <laughs> she would like it was 12 in the night and she said i would like uh, to have pani puris on the streets of uh, mumbai <laughs> it was quite amazing to just witness that as a part of the audience and uh, thank you so much uh, this is a great privilege and uh, Uh, i don't know how to follow this and uh, therefore uh, the best is to slip into a minute of silence as we uh, bring an end to this uh, beautiful conversation with you and uh, thank you so much for your energies thank you for your vibes thank you for your life uh, thank you for your prayers namaste jai guru jai guru